Well, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is set to issue Friday its strongest warning yet that climate change is caused by humans and will cause more heat waves, droughts and floods unless governments take action to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. The IPCC releases their report every six years. It incorporates the key findings from thousands of articles published in scientific journals. The IPCC began meeting earlier this week in Stockholm ahead of the report's release. This is IPCC. CC Chairperson Rajendra Pachori. This working group one session will approve the summary for policymakers and accept the full report. This is happening at a time when the world is awaiting the outcome of this session with great expectation because of its obvious significance in respect of the current status of global negotiations and the ongoing debate on actions to deal with the challenge of climate change. The IPCC report is expected to conclude with at least 95 percent certainty that human activities have caused most of Earth's temperature rise since 1950 and will continue to do so in the future. That's up from a confidence level of 90 percent in the 2007 report. The, the last year, the assessment came out. Meanwhile, the Heartland Institute released a report this week by a group of climate change skeptics called the Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change, or NIPCC. The 1,200-page report disputes the reality of man-made climate change. For more, Greenpeace International's executive director, Kumi Naidu, remains with us, and we're joined by Jeff Masters, director of meteorology at the Weather Underground. On Friday, he'll host the Weather Channel's live coverage of the release of the IPCC's report. He's joining us here in New York studio, ahead of attending Climate Week in New York. Today, he moderates a panel on innovative ways to combat climate change. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Uh, Jeff Masters, the significance of this report that's being released tomorrow. It's huge, because we only see one of these reports every six years, and it lays out a very authoritative and unarguable case that climate change is happening, humans are mostly responsible, it's going to accelerate, and there are things we can do to slow down this sort of climate change upon us. And this report of the non-governmental panel, Heartland Institute? It's what you'd expect from, uh, basically, lobbyists who are working for, for the fossil fuel industry, whose profits are threatened by the scientific findings of the IPCC. You would expect a sort of blowback <laughs> by the fossil fuel industry to dispute the science, to cast doubt, to, to play up some of the arguments ag against it, which really aren't under dispute by scientists. And the conclusions are those not just of the scientists, but also uh, isn't there a sovereign government involvement in the findings as well? Could you explain that for people who are not familiar with how the IPCC works? Yeah, the IPCC is kind of a unique hybrid because it's not just a scientific organization. All of its results have to be approved by government representatives. So this week in Stockholm, the scientists have presented their information, and each government, 195 in total, have to go line by line through the report and approve it. So the politicians have a say in what is in the final report. As a result, the report is very conservative because everyone has to agree. It's unanimous approval required. Jeff, what needs to be done? We have to do two things. We have to cut down our emissions of heat-trapping gases like carbon dioxide, and we have to adapt. We have to get prepared for the coming climate change storm, as I call it. It's already here. We're already seeing the impacts, and we better get ready. Uh, and in terms of what's been leaked about it so far, some of the uh, conclusions may be a little bit surprising. For instance, on uh, the relationship between um, climate change and hurricanes and typhoons, what, what do they say there? Yeah, they've reduced their amount of certainty that we've already seen changes in intense hurricanes due to human causes. So that reflects kind of the, the going scientific work that's been happening, which is not sure. There's a lot of uh, variability in hurricanes naturally. Hard to tell if they're actually changing now due to a changing climate. So that's one positive maybe we can take out of the report. We're not sure we're actually seeing an impact on hurricanes and typhoons. How does Colorado fit into this picture, the thousand-year flood? And then in India yeah. in June, something like 5,700 people died in floods. Yeah, one landslides. thing we are pretty sure of is that climate change is already causing an increase in extreme rainfall events, particularly in North America. And these are the type of events that we saw this year in Colorado and, again, in Asia. 
we've seen an increasing number of very heavy precipitation events, the kind that are most likely to cause some of the extreme floods we've seen in recent years. Well, I wanted to bring uh, Kumi back into the conversation. You're here for the United Nations General Assembly, and uh, obviously President Obama spoke uh, uh, this week at, uh, at the General Assembly. Your assessment of what he did or didn't say about climate change? Well, he hardly mentioned climate change. And the thing about it is, you know, uh, even the CIA and the Pentagon in 2003, in a report that was present to pre uh, given to President Bush, which he chose to bury it, as somebody who was, in effect, an agent of the fossil fuel industry, that, that report suggests in the coming decades the biggest threat to peace, security and stability will not come from conventional threats from terrorism and so on, but will come from the impacts of climate change. So if any head of state, any political leader is concerned about peace, security and stability, then they should be using the platforms at the United Nations now to talk about the biggest urgency this planet has ever faced. Uh, we are talking here already of serious impacts, particularly in the developing world. We are seeing uh, lives being lost. Uh, Darfur, I would argue, uh, as the Secretary General of the United Nations argue, the genocide in Darfur was certainly intensified and exacerbated as a result of climate impacts. Lake Chad, one of the largest inland seas in the world that neighbors uh, Darfur, has largely, uh, you know, uh, to use the words of the Secretary General of the UN, has shrunk to the size of a pond, right? So, and then the Sahel Desert is marching from S Senegal to Sudan southwards at the rate of one mile a year. So water scarcity, land scarcity, and together food scarcity um, was the trigger. So when you see all that happening, when heads of state are talking about all these sort of interventions around chemical weapons, all of uh, uh, which are important, but the biggest threat to peace and security is coming already from climate change and it's going to intensify. So in that sense, I was deeply uh, disappointed that President Obama didn't make that connection. What could the U.S. be doing right now? Well, the U.S. needs to recognize, firstly, that they are compromising their economic future because the U.S. needs to forget about the arms race, space race, and so on. The only race that's going to matter in terms of which countries and companies will be competitive in the future is those countries and companies that get as far ahead of the green race as possible. The U.S needs to take leadership. The world is hungry for U.S. leadership in climate negotiations. And it's interesting President Obama in his speech was making the case for how the U.S. is exceptional. Yes, and, and, and the thing about it is, you know, th that case, the way it gets read, speaking beyond climate change now, is an approach by the U.S. of do as we tell you to do, don't do as we say. Uh, sorry, do as we say, don't do as we do. Because the U.S., if you take on torture, they are signatories to the anti-torture conventions, but we've got waterboarding, we've got Guantanamo, we've got extraordinary rendition uh, on respecting human rights and not violating people's uh, privacy without their knowledge. And, you know, people around the world are saying things like, you know, we had so much of optimism when Obama, President Obama was saying, yes, we can, yes, we can. But with all this NSA spying, maybe you were saying, yes, we scan, yes, we scan, yes, we scan. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask you about what's happening in Ecuador. Last month, Ecuador dropped a plan to preserve swaths of Amazon rainforest from oil drilling by having wealthy countries pay them not to drill. President Rafael Correa said the plan to save parts of Yasuni National Park had raised only a fraction of the money sought. He said, the world has failed us. Well, uh, this week, I had a chance to interview Ecuador's foreign minister, Ricardo Patino, over at um, the Ecuador mission to the United Nations about the Yasuni ITT initiative. He said simply that it failed to attract sufficient funding. All over the world, natural resources are being exploited without um, a great deal of concern about the impacts of that exploitation. And we appeal to the world, and we said we're willing to sacrifice 50 percent of the income that could potentially be generated, but the world has to contribute 
contribuyen con el 50%, and we said if the international community would cover the other 50%, we were willing to, to completely preserve uh, the area of Yasuni ITT and not exploit the oil indefinitely. Pero la respuesta del mundo fue but the world's response negativa. was negative. Unos de um, we only got a uh, very Nosotros few million of si dollars. No and we said, if we don't, the world doesn't respond to our appeal, problema. we are going to have to exploit this oil because we need these resources um, and the resulting income de haber hecho una y otra after having done la espera para obtener los resultados appealed y no and appealed and appealed and not seen an echo to our appeal Ecuador decided no to exploit the oil without affecting the surface of Yasuni this is very important that is Ecuador's foreign minister, um, Ricardo Patino. Uh, President Correa didn't come to the UN. He didn't think um, that uh, uh, the way it is set up, the speeches of countries like Ecuador have an impact. But uh, Kumi Naidu of Greenpeace International, what about what's going to happen to um, what's going to happen to the Yasuni and how important it is? This is a tragedy uh, that what was a innovative and a creative way of ensuring that um, people and nature were actually protected uh, has not been responded to by the international community. It's a reflection of a skewed sense of where we should be investing our global resources at the moment. If we look at the amount of money that's going into taxpayer money that's going into fossil fuel subsidies to the tune of $1.4 trillion a year annually, a fraction of that money, tiny fraction of that money, could have actually secured uh, uh, this very, very fragile uh, part of uh, the world. And people need to realize, you know, in the past when people talked about protecting forests, it was seen as it's all about biodiversity, protecting certain species, and if you liked nature. Today people must understand that forests are the lungs of the planet. It's fundamentally connected to the challenge of um, climate change. It forests uh, capture and store carbon safely. And the more we deplete our forests, and the, the rate we're depleting our forests at the moment is every two seconds, a forest the size of a football field is disappearing as we speak. So our political uh, leaders, particularly in rich countries who have not come up with the money, I think history will judge them very, very A group harshly. of leading environmentalists have sent uh, Correa a letter um, pleading with him not to move ahead, even if the if, international if we, community failed him, because indigenous people in the area are rising up, saying, do not um, develop this, do not drill here. UNESCO designated the park as a world well, biosphere reserve. It contains 100,000 species of animal, many of which are not found anywhere else in the in world. world. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that underscores the disconnect um, with regard to getting our priorities right. And also, I think what you're seeing is that uh, so long as the countries who historically built their economies on uh, fossil fuels, the U.S. and most of the developed countries of the world, if they continue to be saying, we're going to continue with further fossil fuel projects like the tar sands and fracking and so on, it makes it really difficult for organizations like Greenpeace to actually lobby with developing countries to say, you're going to have to leave that coal in the ground and the oil in the soil, uh, when they say, but those folks are still continuing. So we are playing political poker with the future of the planet and the future of our children here and what you're seeing is a terrible case of cognitive dissonance where all the facts are telling us we are running out of time and our leaders continue as business as usual. Well, uh, Jeff Masters, you're, I think you're supposed to be on a panel with uh, uh, Michael Bloomberg uh, uh, today on, on this issue. He certainly has uh, sufficient funds in his own personal <laughs> bank account to uh, help Ecuador uh, with saving the Yasuna. You might raise that issue to him when you talk, when you're on the panel. But I'd like to ask you a little bit more about the 
IPCC report, what we know about it, because obviously it won't be released until uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, the uh, uh, What it says about drought uh, and the future uh, uh, prospects for, uh, for the planet and specifically how it relates to some of the uh, issues uh, or the conflicts that we're seeing in the world even now, uh, and also about the acidity in the oceans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, drought is the number one threat we face from climate change because it affects the two things we need to live, food and water. And the future projections of drought are rather frightening. I mean, we see large areas of the world, particularly the ones that are already dry, are expected to get drier, and that's going to greatly challenge our ability to grow food there and provide water for people. And I was a little disappointed in the leaked draft that I've seen of the IPCC report. It doesn't mention drought at all in the text. There is a mention of drought in a single table that they have there showing that well, we're not really sure we've seen changes in drought due to human causes yet, but we do think, you know, the dry areas are going to get drier and this is going to be a problem in the future. So, yeah, a huge issue. Drought really not addressed very well in the summary. I'm sure the, the main body of the report, which will be released Monday, will talk a lot about drought. And the second issue you raise, the acidity of the oceans, yeah, that we're sure that we've seen an influence. There's been a 26 percent increase in the acidity of the oceans since pre-industrial times. And the pH has dropped by 0.1 units. That's going to have severe impacts on marine communities, we think, and it's only going to accelerate. They're saying with pretty much 99 percent certainty the oceans are going to get more acidic, and it is due to human causes. On drought, can you talk about Syria? Yeah. In Syria, they're having their worst drought in over 70 years, and there have been climate model studies done showing that the drought in that region of the world in particular is very likely more probable due to human causes. If you run a climate model both with and without the human increase in greenhouse gases, you see a large perturbation in the drought conditions there in the Mediterranean region. So we're pretty sure that drought is a factor there. And in Syria in particular, I mean, people have migrated. Over a million people have had to leave their homes because of drought. They've moved into the cities. They don't have jobs there. It's caused more unrest and directly contributed to the unrest there. That's an interesting analysis, Comey. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, uh, others have actually uh, pointed to the big trigger uh, for the conflict in Syria has been um, uh, climate impacts, particularly drought. Uh, but if you look at even Egypt and you look at all the countries that uh, went through the what so-called Arab Spring, I always say so-called because I don't think the struggle for justice is a seasonal activity, but the Arab resistance, um, you see in all of those countries there's been water stress as well. And I mean, some of us have been saying for more than a decade now, the future was will not be fought over oil, but will be fought over water if we don't actually get it right. I mean, our political leaders must understand people cannot drink oil, uh, that people need. I mean, if you look at fracking in the United States, right, the potential danger that has to water security because of the impact on the water table, it is really taking risks. At a, and, and in South Africa, by the way, Shell has got a contract to start fracking in the Karoo, and again, an extremely water-stressed area to start with. So uh, we really need our political leaders to connect the dots, because basically what you see as a problem is a silo mentality to governance, because we put environment and climate change here, we put peace and security here, we put food uh, and agriculture here. All of these things are connected, and we need the leadership we need now is leaders who can think in an intersectoral way and understand the connections to the different global problems we and, face. And Jeff Masters, once this report is issued, what uh, what happens next? And and uh, in terms of uh, uh, there's, there there are further reports that will come out uh, in early 2014. That's right. This is only the first part of a big four-part series. This only talks about what has actually happened to the climate and what the models predict, project will happen. In March, there's going to be a whole other section, which is going to talk about, you know, what are some of the impacts of this? And, and then there will be a further report, what can we do about it? How can we reduce the impacts? So this is going to take over a year to play out. Jeff Masters, skeptics are paying a lot of attention to a part of the leaked report. The IPC said the rate of warming between 98 and 2012 is about half the average rate since 1951. 
Yeah, they like to put in a frame something which they can use to challenge the report. I look at that sort of incidents as a speed bump on the kind of the highway of climate change. We expect natural variability to play a role here. We've got various cycles in the atmosphere and ocean, El Nino, La Nina, the sun changes its brightness some. We expect to see these sorts of uh, slowdowns, and we expect to see accelerations as well. If you go back and look at the 15-year period ending in 2006, the rate of warming was almost double what it was the previous 15 years. Nobody paid attention to that. Which climate change? Which Colorado climate change? The thousand-year flood. We can say that those sorts of events become more common. You roll the dice, you load the dice in favor of more extreme precipitation events. So. You roll double sixes more often, and maybe every now and then you can roll a 13. Are meteorologists on television ever going to start flashing those words climate change as often as they flash the words extreme weather or uh, <laughs> severe weather? Depends on what their producer says. They're beholden to what the producer says, and some are on board and many are not. Amy, if I can just jump in. There's a lesson from history in the United States here yeah, that is helpful. If you look at when the scientific evidence around tobacco was clear um, <laughs> and the consensus was clear that tobacco is bad for you, there was still a f uh, very powerful lobby uh, of scientists funded by the tobacco industry to actually contaminate the public conversation, uh, delay the policy changes that were necessary and so on. We are seeing a carbon copy of that same approach. And I would say to the leaders of the fossil fuel uh, industry, also, there's another thing you need to learn from. When anti-tobacco litigation started in the early days, the CEOs of tobacco companies were arrogant and said, ah, it'll never succeed, they never took it seriously. Climate litigation is starting now, and the fossil fuel companies are actually being dismissive. I say to the fossil fuel industry leaders, Go and ask your CEOs of tobacco companies which is the biggest amount of money that they have to have in the annual budgets today because it has to be, it's often in the legal department because of the scale of uh, settlements. So I think that uh, one expectation once the report is out is that the huge amount of money that goes into lobbying is going to do everything to actually rubbish this report and try and take <laughs> selectively pieces of information. <coughs> I think the American people in particular must interrogate the fact that for every member of Congress, there's between three and seven full-time lobbyists paid by the oil, coal and gas sector. And they have actually held back the possibility of the U.S. being a global leader in renewable technology, and that's going to hurt the U.S. economy in the future. Kumi Naidu and Jeff Masters, thanks so much for being with us. Of course, we'll continue this conversation. Kumi Naidu is the executive director of Greenpeace International, Jeff Masters, director of meteorology at Weather Underground. Uh, he will be hosting Weather Channel's live coverage of the release of the IPCC's report tomorrow. When we come